Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to come to Bilbao again. Uh, the title I've chosen is Marx on the State. This is not because the other title is a fake title, just as we have fake news, but it's because I'm going to locate the distinction between the capitalist type of state and states in capitalist societies within a Marxian framework. And two starting quotations, one from... Levine, what's come down to us as the Marxist theory of the state is a simplification, even a distortion of the writings of Marx and Engels on that subject. And perhaps part of the explanation for that can be found in a letter from Friedrich Engels to Franz Mehring, written in 1893. We neglected the formal side of political, juridical, and other ideological notions, the way in which these notions come about for the sake of their inner content. So I want to do two things in the talk. One is to try to clarify what Marx's ideas about the state were in their evolution, and to pick up on a theme that was emphasized very strongly by Michael Heinrich yesterday, which is the incompleteness of Marx's critique of political economy. The same holds true of Marx's account of the state. And the second thing I want to do is to play on the idea of form and content, which relates to the original title for my presentation, The Capitalist Type of State, which focuses on form analysis, and States in Capitalist Societies, which focuses on the inner content of politics. So that's the introduction. Now, I think some of you will recognize these guys, and it illustrates the differences that I want to try to finesse in my presentation. We had originally Gareth Stedman Jones talking not about Marx's ideas on the state, but the political implications and the political context of Marx's ideas, putting very much the emphasis on what political conclusions can we draw from the development of Marx's ideas across a number of different stages. And then we had Michael Heinrich presenting much more a form analysis, a value form analysis of the critique of political economy. And what I want to do is to subsume both those presentations and say there are different viewpoints on how one might tackle the question of Marx on the state. And so the first thing I'm going to get rid of immediately is the idea that Marx did not write the theory of the capitalist state. Uh, that was one of the six planned books, and Michael Heinrich has written a lot on the, whether there's a six-book plan or a four-book plan and refer to that yesterday. I'm then going to already have indicated the importance of overcoming the form versus content dichotomy. I think there's a very close relationship between form and content, and I'll try to illustrate that. And I'm also going to pick up, but immediately move on from, the idea about the continuity rupture debate because I think any historian trying to do an analysis of ruptures will know there are always discontinuities in continuity and continuities within discontinuity. And this applies particularly to Marx's ideas on the state, where I think we can say that his comments on the Hegel's uh, views on right, philosophy of right or the philosophy of law are an important reference point for Marx's work from the 1840s through to the end of his life. But the ways in which that is interpreted change discontinuously within a continuing engagement with the relationship between state and civil society. 
Then I'm going to turn quickly to Marx's researches on the state, showing the number of different approaches that he developed. And this is not an exhaustive list, just a list. Note two early advances, and then take up a point that Marx makes in the foreword to the 1867 edition of Das Kapital. Beginnings in science are always difficult. Holds for all sciences. And I'm going to suggest that his approach to the state finally crystallizes at the same time as he crystallizes his approach to the critique of political economy. Then I'm going to introduce some themes around form analysis, establish the limits to form analysis, which takes me back to states in capitalist societies, and then, if there's time, give you some case studies. And if there's not time, then I'm going to send the PowerPoint in any case to Inyaki, and you can circulate that to anybody who requests it. But there will be some conclusions, because I will make sure I get to the conclusions, even if I slip some slides. So there isn't a single theory of the capitalist state. I don't see why there should be. The state is such a complex, concrete object that you could not subsume all aspects of the state into a single theory. But what we can do is have different entry points and different standpoints to the analysis of the state. And what we find is that you have critiques of political theory. I've already given the example of Hegel, which are like those of the critiques of the economic categories in classical and vulgar political economy. We have historical analyses of the development, changing forms, and class character of the state. Historical analyses of specific periods and conjunctures, class struggles in France, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Analyses of the capitalist type of state, mainly a form analysis, stressing very strongly that liberal bourgeois democracy is the adequate form of the capitalist type of state. But we know, observing the world either in the 1840s, the 1860s, the 1890s, or today, that by far from all states in capitalist societies are liberal bourgeois democratic states. So this is why we need to look also not just at form, but also inner content. We have historical analysis of the state outside Europe, outside the US in pre-capitalist times, and then some very strategic analysis. Gareth Stedman Jones talked about that yesterday as well. Now a couple of early contributions. This is from uh, an 1844 text. The state is based on the contradiction between public and private life, on contradiction between general interests and private interests, and it can only overcome those contradictions if it abolished itself, which it's never going to do. So there is, in a certain sense, a way in which the reproduction of the state continually reproduces the contradiction between public and private life. If the modern state wanted to abolish the impotence of its administration, it would have to abolish the private life of today. This is a quotation from the Communist Manifesto showing the importance of historical analysis. Each stage in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance. Then there are some illustrations of that. And then finally, with the establishment of large-scale industry and the world market, we finally get the bourgeoisie acquiring exclusive political control through the modern representative state. But what I want to do a little later is to show that when we say that bourgeoisie gains final exclusive political control through the modern representative state, that does not imply the state is an instrument of class rule, but that class rule is now embedded in the nature of the state. And I'll pursue that point a little later. Now we come to the point, every beginning is difficult, holds in every science. This is the British Museum Library. Uh, a 
print from 1857, when Marx was going back to his studies of political economy because of the economic crisis, the first global crisis in the economy, the world market, led him back to studying political economy. And every beginning is difficult, holds in every science, I think is another way of thinking about the different entry points, the different standpoints that Marx took to the analysis of the capitalist type of state and states in capitalist societies. So some successive starting points. In other words, every beginning is difficult. These are some false starts. The separation between the state and civil society, the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Money as a central component of civil society, the Paris manuscripts. Social relations of reproduction, the German ideology. Money as a social relation, the poverty of philosophy. A reconceptualized civil society, the 1857 introduction. Money exchange relations and then capital in the Grundrisse. And then finally, in contribution to the critique of political economy, the commodity and money or simple circulation. And one could continue the list, but I want to stop there and quote you the final, I've got the starting point for my analysis. The opening lines of the contribution to the critique of political economy, which are repeated in the opening lines of Das Kapital, volume one, the wealth of bourgeois society, at first sight, presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, its unit being a single commodity. Every commodity, however, has a twofold aspect, use value and exchange value. And what I want to suggest is this is no accident that he ch decides to start here. And what I want to do in the next part of my presentation is to see what the implications are of saying that the elementary form of the wealth of bourgeois society, the elementary form of a society dominated by the capitalist mode of production is the commodity and what follows from that. Oh, I just turned it off. Let me see if I can turn it back on. Yes, there we are. And this is the preface to the first German edition of Capital. And again, this really refers back to Michael Heinrich's presentation yesterday, the importance of value form as the starting point. The value form, whose fully developed shape is the money form, is very elementary and simple. Nevertheless, the human mind has for more than 2,000 years sought in vain to get to the bottom of it all. Whilst, on the other hand, to the successful analysis of much more composite and complex forms, there's been at least an approximation. Why? Because the body, as an organic whole, is more easy of study than are the cells of that body. And he continues the quotation. In the analysis of economic forms, moreover, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of use. The force of reaction abstraction must replace both. But in bourgeois society, the commodity form of the product of labor or value form of the commodity is the economic cell form. To the superficial observer, the analysis of these forms seems to turn upon minutiae. It does deal with the minutiae, but they're similar to those dealt with in microscopic anatomy. But we must use the power of abstraction, not the microscope or chemical reagents. And one of the influences on Marx's work was, in fact, cell biology. Engels writes in his remarks on Ludwig Feuerbach that there were three major scientific contributions in the 19th century. The laws of thermodynamics, evolution, and cell biology. Marx was an avid reader of the natural sciences and read a great deal on cell biology. And these are some of the lessons one can find in one of the texts that Marx read on cell biology, 
all living organisms are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the most basic unit of life. Cells lead independent lives, possibly shaped by the life of a larger organism. Omnicellular a cellular. All cells arise from other cells. Embryonic cells differentiate into other types of cell. What the hell has this got to do with the critique of political economy? Das Kapital. The living organism of the capitalist mode of production is composed of commodities. The commodity is its elementary form, its elementar tile. Commodities lead independent lives, but are shaped by the life of a larger commercial organism. Omnis merx e merx, Marx didn't say that, but if he wanted to parallel omnis cellular e cellular, he would have said all commodities from commodities. Commodity, money, commodity, or money, commodity, money, prime. Embryonic contradictions in the simple commodity lead to further forms of the capital relation. So I think one can say that Marx is drawing in his form analysis a quite explicit analogy with cell biology, and that's the key entry point. Now, what has I've explained why cell biology might be relevant to the critique of political economy. What the hell has it got to do with the state? This is just a summary table of what I presented, and when you ask Inyaki for the paper, you can get that. So some people have said Marx was interested in cell biology, but had he been writing now, he would have written about stem cells, that the commodity is the stem cell form, not the economic cell form of the capital relation. And this is the National Academy of Science account of the stem cell, a pluripotent cell that can replicate itself or differentiate into many cell types. What's the commodity form? A commodity that can replicate itself, commodity, money, commodity, or differentiate itself into many different forms. And you can see that I'm moving along among those forms of the tax form, the legal form, the political form of the state, the nature of citizenship, and so forth. And I think one can see how there is a relationship of formal adequacy between the capitalist type of state and the capitalist mode of production. Or, again, it can reproduce itself in new ways, the circuits of capitalist production. So that's the the interlude which gets me to where I want to be to analyze the form of the capitalist state before I go on to think about the states in capitalist societies. So we have here a quotation from Capital 3, which I've also found in Capital Tomo 3. The, and you can read this along. You don't even need it translated. The economic form, specific economic form, uh, the direct relationship provides the basis for thinking about the specific mode of sovereignty, the specific mode of law, and so forth. Let me just go back. It's the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social edifice, hence also the political form of the relationship of sovereignty and dependence, in short, the specific form of state in each case. And then we have, relatedly, the Pashukanis question. Again, I found it online last night. It's wonderful what you can get online when you really search. So this is the Spanish version of the Pashukanis question. Uh, why does the form of the state in capitalist societies, or what's the same thing, the relationship of state power not constitute the property of the private ownership, the private possession of a particular class? Why does it take the form of impersonal political domination? Again, this is a contrast between the capitalist type of state and what went before. The answer, in a nutshell, is where exploitation takes the form of exchange, dictatorship may take the form of democracy. There is a relationship of formal adequacy between 
a society based on the exchange of labor power for a price in a labor market with the entitlement of citizens to vote for political authority in a relationship of impersonal domination. And this is something that Marx explores in, in some detail. So we can say that liberal bourgeois democracy is the formally adequate type of capitalist state. But not all capitalist states are democratic. Indeed, after Francis Fukuyama's celebration of the end of history, we're all Democrats now, not we're all capitalists now, but we're all Democrats now, we actually can see a creeping retreat step by step away from formal liberal democracy, the rise of the authoritarian state. And one of the reasons for that is Marx notes a contradiction in capitalist democracies between the political power of the majority and the minority power of the dominant classes. This is from Class Struggles in France. It puts the classes whose social slavery this democratic constitution to perpetuate proletariat, peasantry, petty bourgeoisie in possession of political power via universal suffrage. From the bourgeois class, whose old social power, in other words, its economic and political domination, it sanctions, it supports, it withdraws the political guarantees of this power. It forces the political rule of the bourgeoisie into democratic conditions. It jeopardizes the very foundations of bourgeois society. How to reconcile this comprehensive contradiction? The only way to do it is to separate economic struggle from political struggle. Economic struggle from below must take the form of trade union struggles within the limits of the logic of the market. Once you use economic power, for example, through a general strike to challenge political power, you're in trouble, but you can engage in collective bargaining, etc. Political struggle occurs within the logic of electoral majorities, and you're not allowed to try to overthrow the state, the democratic road is the way forward. And this is Pashukhanas' point. Class is absent as an explicit organizing principle. So when Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, with the triumph of machinofacture, large-scale industry, you get the modern representative state. This is the guarantee of the political domination of capital. It's not because it controls the state directly, but because this separation of the economic and the political reproduces class domination. Now, what does that mean for looking at political class struggle? I'm not talking about economic class struggle. Uh, logic of capital accumulation would simplify the class struggle as the proletariat grew, intermediate classes disappeared. In Das Kapital, we have more of an emphasis on the economic logic of the capital-labor relation. But Marx's political writings are concerned with the most fine-grained analyses of political class struggle, as I hope to illustrate. I'm going to skip that, skip that, and move on now to, and again, what's this got to do with the, the state? Uh, this is the sad tale of the unfortunado Mr. Peel. This is class struggle in Western Australia. This is the Swan River, Swan River Colony, now known as Western Australia. Infortunado Senor Peel. And again, you can read this along. I'll translate it into English while you read it in Spanish. Mr. Peel took with him to Swan River, 50,000 pounds sterling, 3,000 persons of the working class, men, women, and children, and woke up the following day to find himself without his 50,000 pounds sterling. The women and children and men of the working class had disappeared into the bush, taking with him the cattle, the sheep, and so forth. Unfortunate Mr. Peel, who, I don't know, which is the next point, he discovered that capital is not a thing, but a relationship between persons mediated through the instrumentality of things. Exactly the same is true of the state, and this is why I referred to this example. If capital is not a thing, 
but a social relation between people mediated through the instrumentality of things, the state is also a social relation, something emphasized explicitly by Nikos Poulanzas, but can be found equally in Marx, in Gramsci, in Lenin, and so forth. A relationship among people mediated through the instrumentality of state institutions and capacities. So what I've done is to take you to form analysis of the capitalist type of state. But as I've already indicated, even if we look today, the high point of modernity or post-modernity, not all capitalist states are capitalist types of state, liberal bourgeois democracies. What that suggests is while we can get so much from form analysis, we also need other kinds of analysis. And this is just to show you my t original title is not a fake title, it wasn't fake news, but that we can draw a contrast between two modes of analyzing the capitalist type of state. The capitalist type of state based on form analysis, what is the specific constitution of the form of the capitalist type of state, why it is formally adequate, why as Lenin said, once the bourgeoisie lays hold of this ideal form, no change in parties, no change in personnel can shake the hold of the bourgeoisie over the state because they fit so well. Where exploitation takes the form of exchange, dictatorship may take the form of democracy. But that's a historically specific type of state. What's most interesting about it is that here, class power is structural and tends either to be obscure or it's seen as legitimate. The government is legitimate because we voted for it. The state in capitalist societies are more dictatorial. They may be more or less materially adequate. That's to say they may reproduce the conditions of capital accumulation, but they may not. The structure is historically shaped. You can have other kinds of dominant social principle. Think of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. It's a capitalist society, but the main aim of the Iranian state is not to promote capital accumulation. It's to secure the dominance of the religious police, of religious principles in that society. And class power is contingent. It's openly instrumental or mediated via other relations. And what I think is interesting here is that when Francis Fukuyama celebrated the triumph of democracy, everybody's going to follow the United States. Trump is the perfect example of the state in capitalist society where class power is not structural and obscure, but in your face and open and instrumental and it doesn't even seem to be materially adequate in terms of reproducing the conditions of US hegemony. Have I, can I have a couple more minutes? Because yeah. I think yeah. I'm running out of time. Yes. Uh, we have uh, good news, and the good news are that we have a longer uh, uh, possibility to, to, uh, to stay at more five, ten minutes more. So. OK, right. That means that I can finish my presentation without having to cut corners, but I will be as quick as I can. So now the case studies. So what I've done to date is to show you what the capitalist type of state would be like and how that can be related to Marx's form analysis and how there is a relationship one can get following through from the commodity form is the elementar form, the elementary form, the economic cell form, or somewhere else for the German speakers, he refers to keim form or germ form which could also be stem cell form. So one can follow through the form analysis and get interesting results, but that doesn't tell you everything there is to know about states in capitalist societies. We have a couple of case studies. The, the importance of the relative autonomy of the state in factory legislation, competition, cutthroat competition means capitalists can't look after the long-term reproduction of the working class, men, women or children. 
and a whole series of reports are produced, factory inspectors, others, showing that this is actually de leading to the decline of the population. Foucault would refer here to biopolitics. And the biopolitics of factory legislation is the state forces capitalists to look after the interests of the reproduction of the population, which benefits some capitals. Those who have high productivity can afford to pay higher wages, allow lower hours of work, and so forth. So even when you see the state intervening against the interests of some capitals, it may benefit other capitals. French politics, uh, in the preface to the first edition of Capital, Marx says, I'm drawing my material from England, but you Germans don't think this has got nothing to do with you. De te fabula narrata. It's about you, the story is being told. But for politics, he doesn't look at England. He looks at France. The French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternity, the attempts to institute democracy, and so forth. He studies the French state in the same way he studies England for clues about the nature of states in capitalist societies and democracy. And he falls in love with the Paris Commune for quite ironic reasons. So the 18th Brumaire is a key text if you want to look at Marx's analyses of politics because it's a very complicated, multi-layered analysis. And if we can see capital as a contribution to the critique of political economy, we can see the 18th Brumaire as a contribution to the critique of semiotic political economy. You may all be familiar with Marx's statement that men make their own history, but they do not do so in circumstances of their own choosing. But when you look at the immediately following sentence, it's about we can't choose how to interpret the world. The way that we see the world politically, our political imaginaries are inherited from the past. We need, if we're to have a revolution, to develop a new poetry. We need a new political imaginary. So men, don't, men make their own history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing, is a statement about the importance of developing new economic and political imaginaries if you want to make a fundamental revolution. That's also important, because if you don't have new political imaginaries, new economic imaginaries, you can't overcome the separation of the economic and the political struggles that's crucial to reproducing class domination. There's a lot more there. This is Louis Bonaparte. The specificities of political struggles in the modern state. So Communist Manifesto tells you the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. The 18th Brumaire tells you political struggles, class struggles in capitalism take a different form. They're structured on the basis of the forms of democracy or the attempts to get rid of it. How that affects different fractions of capital, the ways in which different regimes considered as social relations, the state power, state power is a relationship between persons mediated through the instrumentality of state apparatuses. As the state changes in France, the stakes of class struggle the balance of forces and so forth change. Mm, I'll be finished for earlier than that. Right? He also looks at the changing institutional structure of the state. He looks at the interrelationship between local, national, international economy and a lot of relatively autonomous political struggles. And then what are the problems of the subordinate classes? The small holding conservative peasantry are like form a class like potatoes in a sack, form a sack of potatoes. That's why you need Louis Bonaparte to represent you. I said the 18th Brumaire can be seen as a contribution to the critique of semiotic political economy. Louis Bonaparte is described as signifying nothing and signifying everything, what might nowadays be called a floating or an empty signifier, that you can project anything you like onto Louis Bonaparte and then the lumpen proletariat. The, finally, the Paris Commune, and this goes back to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, 
the separation between state and civil society, Marx says, finally, I've discovered the adequate form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Paris Commune overcame the separation of state and society through self-organization, self-administration, developed its own police and military apparatus controlled by the communards. And so we have a long arc, Hegel at the beginning, Hegel at the end, that's the continuity, with lots of discontinuities en route, but we come back to what is specific about the modern representative state is the separation between state and civil society, the impersonal form of domination, and so forth. I said the Paris Commune was an irony. The Communist Manifesto had almost zero impact in 1848 through to 1871. And everybody believed, at least among the secret services throughout Europe, the Paris Commune was organized by communists and was inspired by the Communist Manifesto. In fact, the Paris Commune was organized by communards who'd never heard of the Communist Manifesto. But Marx became famous because of the Paris Commune, because of the Communist Manifesto. He didn't come, become famous because he'd found the new form of the post-capitalist state conclusions. Oh, the six book approach, 1857. This is what one could do if one wanted to complete the six books, a book on the state, a book on foreign trade on the world market, and it would be economic and social policy, fiat money, tax, fiscal crisis, great mid small powers. But I'll let you look at that later. These are my conclusions. Marx sought a scientific and not just a philosophical basis for his critiques of political economy, law, and state. He turned increasingly to the natural sciences for insights into how to provide these foundations. The law of thermodynamics gives you Arbeitskraft, labor power. Before that, people studied labor, not labor power. Thermodynamics helped him to come up with the importance of labor power. Evolution, not just Darwin, but also competition, and cell biology for the form analysis. His earlier work critiqued economic and political categories in philosophical terms. Later, he turned philosophical terms, he analyzed them in economic and political categories. Cell theory was an inspiration. That's okay for when you have a formally adequate type of state, it doesn't help you to deal with states in capitalist societies. And for that, you need different kinds of analysis, and for that, you can turn to class struggles in France, the 18th Brumaire, the comments on the Indian mutiny, British politics, German politics, politics in China, and so forth. And so what we need, going back to my first slide, is a synthesis of Gareth Stedman Jones, Michael Heinrich, in the shadow of Karl Marx. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.